welcome you to a, a tentative setup, and uh, we are quite sure how to set ourselves up, not how many people have done. So this is probably more than we thought, but at least as many as we hoped. So what we want to do is simply get started soon on the program so Bill can get started, make his presentation, we enter into discussion with one another. And that is to say that things like lighting and sound and where you want to put your chairs uh, is certainly up to group decision, but not quite yet. Let's try it out and see how, how we best uh, interact with each other and what works to our advantage. It's my hope that we will have once a season, fall, winter, and spring, at least some series of gatherings like this that would be of substantial import around the life of the faith, different disciplines within the life of the faith, but I hope this will prove to be the first of several, so we that it be part of our discussion as we go through this, um, this time together. And I asked Bill to do this because Bill's a longtime friend, he was uh, a graduate student at the University of Chicago when I was a campus minister there. He took French from my wife Sally so he could pass his PhD, <laughs> which he did. So he owes his entire career to, <laughs> to Sally, and he knows it, so he's here today. Uh, but also because he and I have been able to carry on conversations for years about uh, any number of things, but including Westlake, which I'm more than happy to let him start the conversation. And as we get into the areas of ethics and theology, Bill has made some very important contributions to the life of the church and the life of the university. He also, once upon a time, was on the uh, staff at Wesley's Chapel in London, so he brings that along with him. Uh, he's a good friend of Robin Lovin, so the three of us are working on a project around a moral voice, which I mentioned about every third Sunday. Uh, but how does the church help to expand the public vocabulary about issues that are before us? Bill's been teaching at the University of Chicago for how long? 21 years. 21 years. Uh, he's also been head of the uh, Martin Marty Center there for Religion and Public Life. <coughs> Regularly teaching at Heidelberg and other places of, uh, of interest to those of us who never get invited anywhere outside of Rockford and uh, Peoria. Um, so here's what we'll do. It, it, you have had and can pick up again on the table a, a course description, which has a peculiar schedule of three Thursdays on, three Thursdays off, and three Thursdays on. Uh, mainly driven by the fact that the choir is going to be gone for a couple of those weeks, and I know there are a couple of members of the choir who want to be included. Um, so Bill's going to spend the first three weeks dealing with the content of a small book, which you can have on the way out of the uh, gathering tonight. Three simple rules, a Wesley way of living by Reuben Joe, a retired bishop of the church. Then in the second three weeks, which are the November 7th, 14th, and 21st, Bill's going to be talking about John Wesley's primary material, his sermons on the Sermon on the Mount. Now, this book you get because you pay it, <laughs> and because it doesn't cost much. But it's something that you need to read right away because it'll be the topic of conversation for the next two weeks as well as Bill's introduction tonight. I went online to look for what books have John Wesley's Sermon on the Mount, the collection <coughs> in them. And there are such books, and you can find them for yourself. But I also found on the Wesley Center online of the Nazarene Church, all of the all of the sermons right there. So I'll give you that at some point, and uh, we'll sort of decode the, the double numbering of those sermons. But there are 13 sermons for you to read online. You can print them out for your own. We're not inclined to buy the book for you because it's an 18 dollars book you can get. Um, I think you'll be just as satisfied to see it online, or if you can't find that, I've got copies of it, we can make uh, copies uh, as needed. Uh, 
Johnny Miklos and Herman Finch and I have been trying to figure out how to get things set up. And, and uh, which means that some of you paid and some of you haven't. Don't worry, no one gets excommunicated. But before you leave, if you haven't paid the $30, or if you want to have a conversation about that with me or Johnny, that's fine. What we asked with the $30 registration was, in, in fact, a, an earnest fee. Because we wanted to make sure that people saw that this was something that had six parts to it. We would like people to be diligent in being part of that, because we think that there will be some circles of conversation that will develop from it. Uh, out of that, Bill says he doesn't want any of it. So uh, thank you, Bill, for that. Bill's a member of the church, and uh, this is part of his his life in our midst. So you get the book, you get some refreshments, and you'll get an opportunity to uh, meet with Bill. And we're also working tonight to live stream this to see if that works, because there are a number of people who either can't be here tonight or can't get out at night, and they would like to see it. And we're also recording it for archiving it on the um, website. So we hope that as we develop our techniques of it, this will be a a wider range discussion than even what we're able to have here tonight. But thank you so much for being here tonight. Bill, what do you get us up? Well, thank you very much, Bill, and uh, thank you all for coming. It's a real honor and delight for me to be here this evening. Um, let's start with a word of prayer, and then I'm going to introduce myself, what we're doing in the course, and then uh, within the remaining six hours of this evening, I will give my lecture. <laughs> But let's start with a word of prayer at the beginning. Let's bow our heads. O God of truth and spirit of wisdom, descend upon us this evening that we might plumb the questions of how we ought to live and to live faithfully. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, you've heard my name is William Schweiger. I teach at the University of Chicago. One of the reasons why we have to have the air going this evening is that it only takes one University of Chicago professor to steam up a room with hot air. <laughs> and so we've got the air conditioner going. Um, I work in the area of theological ethics. That is, and I'll be saying more about this in a few minutes, the interrelationship between thinking about the meaning and truth of Christian faith and thinking about how one ought to live a life worthy of our humanity interested in the intersection of those. If you open up any newspaper any day of the week, you will find that the whole world is talking about the relationship between religion and how we ought to live. From terrorist bombings, from churches being destroyed, from people praying for health and overcoming sickness, the questions we are discovering are at the very root of what it means to be a human being. We're those creatures who have to figure out how to live. And that's distinctive to being a human being. Now, I also have to be very passionate about what I do because I love it. I think it's a lot of fun. It's engaging. This means that I can start speaking rather quickly sometimes or start using terms that you may not follow. Please raise your hand, ask me what I mean, tell me to slow down. Our only tools as Christians reflecting on our faith and life, our ideas, concepts. If we don't know what a term means, we can't use it properly. If we're sloppy in how we use our concepts, we can bring a lot of confusion and danger into the world. So you're going to be introduced to some terms and concepts, gaining the tools to think ethically about the Christian life, if I'm using a term you do not know what it means, just raise your hand. I mean, this is meant to be a dialogical encounter over the six sessions. Tonight I'll be speaking more than I usually will be. Um, and I'll be giving somewhat of a summary of the whole course this evening, not just the Ruby Joe text. But if you're not following the term, there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know what that means, okay? Uh, it's very important that we do such. So don't feel bad if you interrupt me. It's fine, I get interrupted all the time. Um, Phil mentioned the syllabus. I also ran off a copy here, if people want it, of the various uh, readings and so on. Although uh, each class period will be taken up with me talking for a while. 
And then we'll look at the texts that we've read for that week and hope open conversation and discussion about it. I would like each of you to think about, when you're doing the readings for a particular week, think about one paragraph in the readings, maybe even just one sentence, that you think is uniquely either confusing or important. And we'll ask someone what their passage is, and we'll start working on that to get into the text. Um, so we're going to be engaging, this will, we'll see the importance of this in a moment, we're going to be engaging scriptural texts, we're going to be engaging the history of Christian thinking, we're going to be engaging our own experience, and we're going to be engaging the Bible. All of those come into thinking about the Christian life from a Wesleyan perspective. Now let's take a minute now, if we could, uh, I'm sorry to block you this briefly. And just have everyone say their name, introduce themselves very briefly, a sentence or two, what's your major, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, then, and then I'll tell you what the program is for this evening, then I'll get started, and then sometime tomorrow morning we'll have QA. Okay? So why don't we start here? Hi, everybody. I'm Bruce Shea. I've been here for a couple of years. I'm involved with the Justice Ministry and enjoyed the uh, university. Okay. Uh, hey. uh, I come here on Sundays, um, and I, I went to a little school at uh, the University of Chicago, so I knew I was going to this one. Sharon Rader, and I'm majoring in retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Lane Rader, uh, I'm a pastoral counselor, retired. I'm Margaret Andrews, uh, I've been a member of the church since 97. I'm Chuck Andrews, I like to wear hats. <laughs> and tonight I'm wearing the hat of a student from my favorite yeah. pants. Uh, Steve, yeah. Steve Hoover, a um, member of the choir, and, uh, the resident organ builder for the church. <laughs> Barry Winger, the organist here at the church, and uh, like being a student as well. I don't know if you knew this, but Charles Wesley had this little portable organ that they would carry around, and when I was at Wesley's chapel, we used that every day for devotions. We're hoping, to, I'm hoping to play it in a couple of weeks, so. Oh, well, okay. wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I'm Eric Zacherson, I'm a city designer here in Chicago. Great. So we come down the front here then? Or get our camera in. Okay. Do you want to introduce yourself? Well, all right. I'm behind the camera here. I don't think I can photograph myself. I'm David Driscoll. I guess I'm the unofficial videographer for the Chicago Temple. There you are. We have our other photographer. Hey, I'm Tom Lipa. I've been a member here for, or I've been attending for maybe 10 years. Please. I'm Catherine Abraham. Um, I've been coming since I moved to Chicago here in uh, December. Uh, I'm Adam Hammer. I've also been coming here for about six months or so. Uh, graduate student at Loyola at the University. In what are you? Uh, biology. Good. Um, I'm and then we're over. Well, we know this guy, so. I'm Carol Emmons, and uh, I've been here about 11 years, I think. And I'm majoring in retirement. You stole my thunder. <laughs> and also, I'm a wedding coordinator. I'm Carol Mike Horn. I'm a UC graduate. Very <laughs> good. I teach at UIC, I'm measurement and statistics there. We've been coming to church, I guess, about 12 years ago. David, my friend, I'm a, a musician in the church and a licensed clinical social worker in the special education department. Uh, I'm Brenda Russell. I'm a runaway Baptist, so I'm excited <laughs> to learn all about the Methodist thing. Uh, Amy Hilliard. I'm phasing out of being a coordinator of international service learning in the Philippines for a small not-for-profit. Susie, I attend another church and feel good to be here tonight and 
I'll be taking some classes in U of Chicago. Oh, Hi, I'm Evelyn, and um, I've been coming here for about, I mean, I've been a member for about two years, and I'm an occupational therapist. My name is Shirley Beck. Um, we moved here about a year ago. We became members very soon afterwards. I'm relatively new to Methodism. Um, I joined the Methodist Church after we got married about eight years ago, because I like this church better than mine. <laughs> Alan Bath, I'm in the choir, and I'm majoring in physics and chemistry, I'm teaching a bunch of homeschool in the world. Hi, I'm Jan Van Meyer. I'm a Wesley Wanderer, looking forward to my second trip to England with uh, my favorite tour leader, Phil Blackwell. I'm <laughs> Finch, and I went to the University of Chicago back when they were veterans. Good evening, I'm Johnny Mendes. I'm a church administrator here and a member of the uh, Chicago Temple for the last five years. I'm looking forward to a continuation of lifelong learning. I'm Clark Power. My family and I have been attending for a couple of years. I was raised in uh, a church very similar to the Mennonites, so I'm a relative newcomer two years. Welcome, everyone. Um, you might notice that the title of tonight's... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm Stephanie Vasquez. I've uh, been working at the Chicago Temple for about a little over six years, and I'm a graduate of Moody Bible Institute, and I get to work with Phil every day in the porch and all sorts of things. Good to see everyone. You might notice that the lecture this evening is on uh, thinking about the Christian life, religion, and reason. In one sense, that title is what I want you to take away from all of us. Uh, Methodists are often known for, well, they used to be known for being teetotalers. Sometimes they're known because they got warm hearts, supposedly Wesley at Heartburn or something. Um, and good deed doers. But we are actually part of a powerful intellectual tradition that continues to feed schools all over this country. The number of universities and colleges founded by Methodists is astonishing. <coughs> Wesley himself was an Oxford professor. And what I want us to do is to tap into the wellspring of that intellectual tradition and what resources it may have for us thinking today and what resources we may need to revise in certain ways. I want to do two uh, several things this evening. One, talk about what actually we are doing in this course. Then I want to throw us back into history a little bit, a very famous uh, encounter between John Wesley and a man named uh, Bishop Joseph Butler, who was a bishop in the Anglican Church and a renowned moral philosopher. Um, he makes very important arguments that are even um, important for our day. And then we'll end with this question again about reason in the theological and philosophical end. So that's the kind of trajectory we're on. And like I said, I'm going to be trying to fold in much of the ideas and topics that we'll be addressing over the rest of the five weeks. Does that sound reasonable? Uh, again, if I get going too fast or using terms you're not aware of or familiar with, please let me know. Okay? And like I said, I'm going to try to keep this as brief as I can to my six hours. Now we're going to start with an examination. Okay, I want to do a brief little examination as we decode the following four terms. Wesley's Christian Theological Ethics. We're going to start getting clarity about each one of those terms. And under the Wesley part, we have to start with an examination. What is the examination? The following. I want you to raise your hand when you agree with a certain statement, or don't raise your hand if you don't. How many people in this room want to be happy? <laughs> Wesley once said, it's actually in his notes on the New Testament, that the Sermon on the Mount teaches the art of happiness. <coughs> the art of happiness. Oftentimes, folks see Christianity as believing in rational doctrines or trying to be good to Hebrews. Wesley thinks it's about human flourishing. We may want to take a moment to think about 
Okay, everyone raised their hand, they want to be happy. How many of you think that everyone in this room has the same idea of what happiness is? <laughs> no one thinks that, right? Therein lies the problem. If we're concerned with the art of happiness, we have to get clear about what we mean by happiness. happiness. Human flourishing, human well-being. That's the subject matter of ethics. Ethics is not a set, a set of do's and don'ts. It includes some do's and don'ts, but it's more basically about living a life worthy of our humanity. Second part of the, the quiz. Um, how many people in this room think that there's something wrong when Martin Luther King is gunned down? How many people think, if they're really honest, that there's something wrong when very wealthy people live off the poverty of others? Okay. How many people think that good people always have happiness? How many people in this room think that those who make their living off the back of others may nonetheless be living a life they think is happy, and our culture tells them it's happy. Okay? Wesley thinks that the Christian life is the art of happiness, but he thinks it's also related to holiness. That is, to be a just and virtuous person. Because we just did a test, and we all, I think, if I follow the test, we all agree that when we think about what the highest form of a happy, full human life would be, it would also have to be a virtuous good life. Which is why we're offended when a Martin Luther King has gone back. We think that somehow holiness and happiness should go together. We think that somehow justice requires that good people flourish, that they're not gone down in their youth, that they're not starved. Is that making sense so far? Everyone following? Okay, now we get to the last question. So we've already determined, we all want to be happy. We've always all determined that, well, we want to make sure that good people live flourishing, happy lives. Right? And we think there's something wrong that doesn't happen. How many people in this room think that they are holy enough that they deserve to be happy? <laughs> Come on, how many people in this room think that they're holy enough <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> right. Therein lies the problem of Christian ethics. How is the life of virtue and righteousness and justice related to a life of happiness? And how is it that our own lives, even though we dream of that relationship, and you'll see some of this in Ruben Job's opening introduction, even though we can dream and imagine a world in which just people are also flourishing, we also know in our hard hearts that that's not us. So part of what is going on in Christian theological ethics is dealing with that deep problem. And that's in a sense what we're going to be doing this whole time. We're trying to think through what could possibly be the relationship between happiness and happiness. That's why Wesley understands the Sermon on the Mount to be the essence of Christianity. Many people, when they write their Christian ethics, think about the Ten Commandments. Many people, when they write Christian ethics, think about virtues. Wesley thought it was found in the Sermon on the Mount. And as I've already noted, he mentions that, does anyone remember what Bible Wesley would have been? What translation of the text? King James Version. That will really test you. Does anyone remember how the first of the Beatitudes begin in the King James Version? Happy are they. Not blessed, as we now do in the current translation. And that's why, as I mentioned before, Wesley talks about uh, the Sermon on the Mount as the Ark. So what we're going to be wrestling through this six times, these six lectures, is really the interrelationship between those two very basic human needs and how they're related in our lives. Right? 
Second thing, so the first thing, Wesley's theological ethics, Wesley, we realize we've got a problem. This is how he's seeing the human condition and what he thinks the business of Christian living is about, the relationship of happiness and goodness. The second, it's interesting that we've already mentioned in our conversation four sources for how one thinks about the Christian life. We've mentioned the Bible, so no, no. We've mentioned Christian tradition. I know that some Christians think about the Christian life in terms of the Ten Commandments, others about virtues, not Wesley. We've mentioned reason. And we've also implicitly, by doing our examination, we've mentioned our human experience. Those are called the Wesley quadrilateral, the four sources for thinking about the Christian faith and the Christian life. Scripture, tradition, reason and experience, okay? um, and we want to be able to tap into all four of those. I remember seeing bumper stickers that say things like, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. That is a completely non-Wesleyan way to think about the Christian life, because you've got to supplement the Bible with reason, experience, and tradition. The interaction of these four sources will be going through that as well. Fourth, um, under this first term, Wesley, Wesley thought that the main challenge before the church was not atheism. It wasn't people who denied God. He thought the real problem was what he called the halfway Christian. That is, people who spout religious beliefs that don't live a religious life, who spout dogmas and doctrines and are absolutely sure that the world was created in seven days, damn it all, and yet that doesn't lead at all to a transformation of their own life or the society in which they are a part. Um, if it is a form of atheism, it's what uh, the old 18th century guys called practical atheism. That is, one says theoretically that I believe everything in the Bible, but practically as I'm living, I deny everything that's involved in the Christian faith. Wesley is concerned to address the halfway Christian, which is all of us, actually. He wants to see uh, the transforming power of faith in human beings' lives and in the society in which they're a part. And he thinks Christianity does that, and when it happens, a person experiences happiness and holiness. Their life becomes full, rich, worth living. So that's the Wesley part of the title of our course, Christian. Well, this suggests that there can be non-Christian forms of theological ethics. There can be, there can be Islamic, there can be Jewish, there can be this theological ethics. We're looking at um, Christian theological ethics, and even more specifically, Protestant theological ethics, since Wesley was a Protestant. Um, and therefore, he's concerned with God's love for sinners, those people who can't sort of get holiness and happiness together, uh, God's love for such people and the revolutionary force that can have in it and in societies. He's interested, if you want the old doctrinal terms, he's interested in justification, what makes us right in relation to God, and sanctification, what makes for a whole life. Theological, so we got Wesley, Christian, theological. The term theology just means, it's a conglomerate to Greek terms, theos, which means God, and logos, which means reason or discourse. So theology is just thinking about God. That's all it is. Now, not every time someone uses the term God are they doing theology, because they may not be thinking about it. Several years ago, there was a very popular song. I don't remember who the artist was, but one of the main refrains was, what if God was a slob just like the rest of us? Anyone ever hear that song? Yeah. 
Well, that's not a theological statement. <laughs> and we know that because a moment's reflection on what the term God must mean cannot include sloth. Theology is thinking about beliefs in God and the Christian faith. Okay? And that's what we're doing. We're not practicing Christianity. That's something that Phil does far better than I do. That happens on Sunday. We are doing theology. We are thinking about the life we're trying to live and the faith we confess. So theology is not religion. It is not faith. It is rather trying to think about the meaning and truth of one's religion and one's faith. And this gets tricky because part of the difficulty, I think, in the churches and in our contemporary culture is that we too quickly take certain images of God as if they are God. But we know that can't be the case, we think, theologically. It says in the Bible that God is a rock. How many people here really think God is a rock? Right. I hope no one. <laughs> a moment's reflection shows that can't be true, literally. How many people think here that God is a father? Okay. Is that the same as a literal father? No. So as soon as we start thinking about these terms, we realize that we have to approach the resources of our tradition with much greater care. And unfortunately, we're in a culture that's enthralled with images, enthralled with Sense. One of the reasons why I never use PowerPoint is because theology is learning to think without images. <laughs> to question images, <clears throat> like God is a rock, or God is a father. So I don't want to feed the very problem we're trying to overcome. So theology is not a religion of faith, it's thinking about our faith in the meaning of religion. Last term in our four terms, ethics. What is ethics? Well, it's one of the oldest disciplines in Western civilization. It goes back to the ancient Greeks. The Greek philosopher Aristotle said there were really only three disciplines. Physics, the study of the natural world. Logic, the study of intellectual principles. And ethics, the study of everything human and how to live. Our culture tends to identify ethics with a lot of do's and don'ts. I'm trying to start this evening in a way you see that we're exploding that. Our subject is human existence and how to live it in a way that's worthy of our humanity. Another term that gets um, related to this, ethics comes from the Greek term for character and conventional the Latin translation of ethics is morals. So we have two different language fields, Greek and Latin. And oftentimes in our society, we confuse those. So we think that ethics and morals are the same thing. For specialists like us, we reserve the term ethics for thinking about people's moral lives. Much as theology is thinking about religion, Ethics is thinking about morality. Morality is what you're doing every day of your life when you decide what to do. Ethics is when you step back and say, is that really the right thing to do? Is that really justified in saying? Faith is what you do on Sunday morning, going out for the Eucharist. Theology is when you step back and reflect on what that means and its truth. Okay? So theological ethics then is kind of second order reflection on our experiences of life and our moral beliefs as well as our religious convictions. Okay? Now is that relatively clear? Just clearing the ground so we know what we do. Is everyone with me? Are there any questions to this point? Please don't be bashful. Because I realize this may be um, not what you imagine an ethics course to be about. Reuben Job's book is probably closer to what you expected. He's actually doing what I would call moralizing. He's, propo he's proposing a set of actions. We're trying to think about whether those actions should be proposed or not. Okay? 
Yes. I have a question. When you say faith is, is what we do on Sunday when we go for communion for Eucharist, do you use that as an example of faith? Or should be faith? I, I, in my mind, faith should be more than that. I'm just. Well, yeah, faith is um, trust and loyalty in God. So right? It's in trusting, that. and one of the ways we show that we trust God and that we are loyal to God's purposes is by taking a ritual meal in which he feeds us. Or she feeds us. Okay, so it's an example of our faith. It's a yes. demonstration. Yeah. It's an expression of faith. Okay. Uh, but this is important also for Methodists because the Wesleyan movement in England, when it started, every time the Methodists came into a, um, a church, an Anglican church, attendance at the Eucharist went up. Attendance at church went up. And Wesley thinks it's very, very important, and this is one thing that Ruben George is quite good at, he thinks it's very important to go through the practices of the faith. So you're right, maybe it would be better to say practices of the faith. Um, but what Wesley is suggesting is that if you say, well, you know, I'm a really spiritual person, but I never go to church, I never pray, I never take the Eucharist. For someone like Wesley, that would be, be very curious use of the term. Faith should manifest itself in various ways. Any other? Yes? Can you repeat your summary? Yeah, I'm trying to say, just as geology is not rocks, but the study of rocks, theology is not faith, it's the study of faith, it's meaning and truth. And ethics is the study of moral beliefs and actions. Part of the trick here is that some disciplines have the same term for their subject matter as for the discipline. That's one of the things that ethics does, it gets confusing. So, but we're trying to reflect on the moral life of the Christians. Okay, I just come to like this one interesting question. You think ethics is before moral things, or you do something and then you reflect upon it and it becomes a new ethics? Um, yes. <laughs> uh, I'm not setting up a causal relation. Um, sometimes we engage in, we have certain beliefs about what is a just or good thing to do, and we do them, and then we step back and say, now wait a minute, is that really true? At some point, most folks growing up, at least in this culture, start asking themselves, were well, the things my parents believe and they told me was more, or are they really more? Then you're doing that. Yeah. Right? Right. Uh, at other times, it goes the other way around. Right. Anything else? On this, just so we have a sense of the topography, we can also pause in case we really need to flee the room. Okay, then let's turn to some history, just to give a little bit more punch on what's going on here. And this is an encounter between this Joseph Butler and John Wesley. Um, they are both Anglican theologians. Methodism was a movement within the Anglican Church, within the Church of England. And Wesley is a very Anglican thinker in some respects. Uh, and he represents a different side of that tradition than Joseph Butler. Um, Anglicanism has no central theologian. There is no Martin Luther, there is no Thomas Aquinas, there is no St. Um, the closest they come to this is a man named Richard Hooker, um, who wrote, I think this is. We couldn't get books this title anymore, but it's, it's fabulous. It's the laws of ecclesiastical polity. <laughs> and he said, he said two things. The Anglican Church is seeking a middle way between Catholicism and Lutheranism and Calvin. The middle path, the via media. And secondly, um, Hooker said that the Anglican Church has three sources for its claims. Tradition, scripture, and reason. Wesley has experience. Otherwise, he's a good son of the uh, church of England. What this means is that subsequent Anglican thought could emphasize either a more rational side, which we'll see in Butler, or a more empirical side, experiential side, which is what Wesley's 
Paxson. And for those who are interested in the history of thought, Wesley read a lot of John Locke. John Locke was very important in the background for the founding of the United States, and he had a particular argument about how we come to ideas through experience. And Wesley agreed with that. In any case, the Anglicans were seeking a middle path to via media between Catholicism and Lutheran and Calvinistic Protestantism. And we're going to see that in these two figures. Okay? Now, <clears throat> while they share the Anglican Church, they differ profoundly. Uh, Butler lived from 1692 to 1752, Wesley, 1703 to 1791. Butler was a bishop in the Church of England, and he develops, as we'll see in a moment, a very rationalistic ethic that seeks to show the harmony between what he called cool self-love and benevolence or care for others. Um, Wesley becomes an evangelical preacher who's going out the highways and the byways proclaiming the priority of God's grace and the importance of Christian perfection. The two of these men met at one point in the revival, uh, in, in this revival in 1739, and Butler, in, when they met each other, insisted, these are quotations, quote, our faith is itself a good work. It is a virtuous temper of mind. So faith for Butler is a virtuous temper of mind. Wesley replied that one is justified by grace alone, and then he went on and said, but how it can be called a good work, I see not. It is the gift of God, and a gift that presupposes nothing in us but sin and misery. They got into an argument. Butler charged Wesley with, quote, pretending to extraordinary revelations and gifts of the Holy Ghost, which is a horrid thing, a very horrid thing. And then he pronounced Episcopal disapproval on Wesley. Wesley retorted by saying that he'd been ordained by the church universal and he could preach anywhere he wanted to. And it wasn't too long after that in which Wesley was finally moved out of the church. But that was not all for Wesley and the Anglican Church, because it was not only the Episcopacy that uh, disapproved of the revival, it was also rejected by the aristocracy at the time. The Duchess of Birmingham, for instance, saw the doctrine of the Methodists, quote, as most repulsive and tinctured with impertinence and disrespect towards one's superiors. And then she added, quote, it's a monstrous thing to be told that you have a heart as sinful as the common wretches that crawl the earth. This is highly offensive and insulting, unquote. So not only the high church, but also the aristocracy within England was rejecting this message that the only thing God presupposes in us is sin. Faith is a gift, but the life of faith is an art of happiness to live out in a relationship with happiness and all things. So we're looking at two figures with deep controversy about the very nature of Christianity. Uh, let me say just a few things then about Butler, uh, if I can. Is this all right? A little background. He also wrote a lot of sermons. Uh, their famous ones are the sermons at Rolls Chapel in which Butler writes the following. Quote, let it be allowed, oh, one of the reasons I'm using these quotations now is you're going to be thrown back into 18th century English. <laughs> and uh, it might take you a little while to get used to it, uh, but hang in there, it, it will start to make sense, and sometimes it's really quite beautiful. So at any rate, in his 11th sermon at Rural's Chapel, Butler writes, let it be allowed Though virtue or moral, moral rectitude does indeed consist in affection to and pursuit of 
what is right and good as such. Yet that when we sit down in a cool hour, we can neither justify to ourselves this or any other pursuit till we are convinced that it will be for our own happiness, or at least not contrary to it. Others say that no matter how much we may be taken with the idea of justice, or fairness to others, or love and neighbor, we never really act on that in a concrete case until we're clear that it's not going to harm ourselves. And notice, we already have the problem we started our examinations with this evening, the relation of self-love and virtue of justice to others. What Butler is saying is, if we're really honest, folks, when it comes down to it, we're willing to help others as long as it does not harm ourselves. That's cool self-love. Now, Butler was responding to a couple of forces which we can get into in q and a if you want, that are called deism on the one hand, the belief that God is sort of like the, the universe is a clock and God has made the universe and turned it on, turned it to running and then left it to go on its own. But the real people that Butler and Wesley and many others were fighting was a guy named Thomas Hobbes. Have you ever heard of him? Arguably the most important person in modern political thought, lived 1588 to 1679, and wrote a famous book called The Leviathan. Hobbes believed two things. One, that human beings are and should be egoists. That everything that drives our behavior is our own self -interest. Anyone hear that in commercials or <laughs> economic policies? It's, it's rife in the economics department of my university. That everything can be reduced to self-interest. This is exactly what Hobbes taught. It's also what Anne Rand, for instance, teaches. It was very popular. I don't know when you pointed out the fact that this was an old argument. And Hobbes was refuted by, yes, she guessed it, Joseph Butler. So the first thing is that all human beings are and should be driven by nothing but self-interest. This is called ethical humanism. Second thing he believed is the following. If everyone is driven by their own self-interest, and we've already established that everybody thinks that there's something, that happiness means something different from them, what's going to happen if we're all pursuing our own self-interest and we're stuck in the same room? What do you think is going to happen? Is there going to be a mystical peace that will descend on What's going to happen? Chaos. Chaos. Uh, Hobbes put it, the war of each against each. He thought that the natural condition of human beings, as driven by absolute self-interest, was to exist in a state of war, of each against each. And that finally, what happens is people realize at some point I'm not going to be the biggest guy in the room. At some point I'm not going to have the biggest club. At some point I'm not going to have the best nuclear weapons. At some point I won't be able to have our drone stuff work. We have to figure out a treaty among ourselves. And that treaty is what gives rise to the state, to the Levi, which is the instrument of coercion over all of us who would really rather spend our time more in each other. Okay? Butler and Wesley are, in different ways, attacking that philosophy of Hobbes. They're trying both to argue that human beings are not driven only by self-interest. And furthermore, there are ways of cooperating that do not rely only on the use of power. Butler does this through a very complicated argument about the nature of the human psyche. He tries to show that there are three different levels in the human psyche. A level of desires and passions, a level of principles that we adopt, 
adopt to moderate our passions and desires. And a third level we call conscience, which is to tell us our duty in relationship to our passions and those middle principles. It's, um, well, I can go on for hours on it. It's a brilliance, and it's seen as the definitive refutation of that. If uh, Mr. Ryan had only read Bishop Butler, he would have been enthralled with Anne Rand quite so much. <laughs> Someone got a question? We have a commercial. <laughs> Sorry, I don't do commercial. <laughs> Let me end with one quote from Butler and then we'll turn to this is sort of the peak of his analysis of human beings, this complex system of passions and principles and conscience. He argues, wherein in reality the very constitution of our nature requires that we bring our whole conduct before the superior faculty of conscience, weigh its determination, enforce upon ourselves its authority and make it the business make it the business of our lives as it is absolutely the whole business of a moral agent to conform ourselves to it this is the true meaning of the ancient precept love thyself so even Butler moves to the level where he wants to say true self-love is actually living by the dictates of conscience, which properly relate self-love and concern for others. But this is a very rationalistic ethics. Uh, you can read through the 11 sermons at Rolls Chapel, and there's barely a mention of God. He wrote theology, but his theology God was a fairly remote rational principle in this order of the universe of which human beings are part and need to order their own lives. Right? That brings us to Wesley, a very different vision. Same problem. How do we think about the relationship for, between care for others, justice and righteousness, and our own self-love? When I ask you all, did you want to be happy, another way to put that is, do you all love yourself? Do you want to see well-being for yourself? That's self-love. And the question is how these interrelate. So let's turn to Wesley. Uh, as you know, we're raised in the context of high church Anglicanism. Uh, wrote, read thinkers like Jeremy Taylor on holy living and holy dying, Thomas Kempis, William Law on Christian perfection, Oxford professor, tutor, this instilled in him this problem, or his worry about the halfway Christian. And he always saw himself as kind of halfway Christian. He thought that one's whole life should be dedicated to God and neighbor. And it is out of that dedication that springs his ethics. It is one, it's an ethics as we're going to see over the next six weeks, or nine weeks, whatever the weeks. Um, that is about how a justified person's will is oriented to God and to neighbor, and that love for God and neighbor is actually our truest happiness, our truest happiness. He called that perfection, which is a very complicated idea. In our culture, we tend to identify perfection with like being the best linebacker. <laughs> or you have to go and have certain kind of cosmetic surgery so you have the perfect body. It's not what Wesley's meaning by the term. What does he mean by the term? Well, another quote, get used to this kind of English. This is from his plain account of Christian perfection. Listen very carefully, okay? He writes the following. It's three different accounts of what Christian perfection is. He thinks they're all the same, but he's doing it three different. Quote, in one view, Christian perfection is purity of intention, dedicating all of one's life to God. It is giving God all our heart. It is one desire and design ruling in our tempers. It is the devoting, not of a part, but all 
of our soul, body, and substance to God. In another view, so two, it is all the mind that was in Christ, enabling us to walk as Christ walked. It is the circumcision of the heart from all filthiness, all inward as well as outward pollution. It is a renewal of the heart and the whole image of God, the full likeness of him that created it. In yet another, this is the third definition, it is loving God with all our heart and our neighbor as ourselves. So what Wesley thinks is the core of Christian perfection is loving God with our neighbor. Christianity is not a bunch of interesting and esoteric or strange doctrines. Christianity is not believing in the words of the Bible literally every step of the way. Christianity is not about the hierarchy in the church. Christianity is even not necessarily taking the Eucharist. Christianity at its core is love of God and love of neighbor. And Wesley's going to try to show how that is also the art of happiness. Now, Wesley pursued this, as you may know, with a certain uh, rigor. <laughs> and him and his brother formed a study group at Oxford for prayer, for self-examination, for reading the ancient church fathers, for visiting the sick and visiting the prisoners. And they came to be called Methodists because they were very methodical. They called themselves the whole people, but very methodical. Nonetheless, he and his brother went to a missionary trip to Georgia and the U.S. and utterly failed in their mission. On the way back, he ran into some Arabians that he thought were more faithful than he himself. And then, in 1738, he had a conversion experience at Aldersgate while hearing the preface to Luther's commentary on the Book of Romans being read. This is an intellectual. He gets converted here, read Luther's commentary on the Book of Romans. What that meant for uh, Wesley was a new emotional assurance of faith. And that grounded his intellectualism and his self-discipline. And it led him off to preaching in fields, working with the poor, the outcast, forming Methodist societies writing textbooks on medicine to help the poor, establishing schools, on and on and on. In fact, some scholars argue that it was the Wesleyan revival that helped England escape the horrors of the French Revolution because the Wesleyans moved in to help the poor, so there wasn't a need for a revolution. That may be a little bit of an overstatement, but the point here is that Wesleyan faith is intensely social and intensely, intensely personal, inward. And that is something I think if you listen very carefully, you're going to hear from the pulpit at the Chicago Temple every Sunday. Uh, you're getting a good dose of Methodism every Sunday in this church, at least in my experience. How to hold together intensely personal faith with social activism to restructure the society. Not all tradition, Christian sides of the tradition want to hold those two other things together in that way, but Methodism does. Now we're going to see over the next few weeks that this gets to be rather complicated and also extremely interesting. Wesley thinks that there's actually two levels to faith. Go back to your question about faith. But this is a theme we're going to pick up next time, so I'm foreshadowing a little bit. On the first level, Wesley thinks that faith is, to quote from Hebrews 11, which is where he's taking it, from, he thinks it's the evidence of things not seen, the evidence of things hoped for. Faith on the first level is to awaken to the spiritual mystery of our existence. It's to perceive that as more is going on in the universe than just flesh and blood. It's to, to 
be shocked into the awareness that your existence is deeper and more profound than just the physical bodies we have and the psychologies we have. It's the evidence of things not seen. Now, this is one of the reasons why religion has sometimes been called the cult of the invisible. That is, most religions, and certainly Wesley, think that to be religious is to see the world differently because you're seeing more things than what you could do with your normal senses. He also thought that faith at this first level was a sense just like our five other senses. So it's to experience the richness and deepness of life. <clears throat> That's the first level. The evidence of things not seen. Part of what he's doing in his sermons is to awaken you to that first level of faith, since he thinks most of us don't even have that level. Second is genuine saving faith. This is the second level. This is where this is what he had in his conversion. It's where one is audacious enough to say, God loves me personally, myself and all my sinfulness. It's to be aware, as Wesley might put it, of God's gracious disposition to you. And it is an experience. That's why experience, that's really what he means by experience as one of the sources. The awareness that this spiritual reality one first discerned is also loving for oneself. We're going to trace out what all that means and how, what a very subtle account he has of religious life and working on these different levels and how they relate to his conception of Christian perfection. So, as what, uh, Albert Alper, one of the great uh, scholars of Methodism, put this in a pithy little statement. Uh, let me write this, or read this, he said, the ancient and Eastern Orthodox tradition of holiness as discipline and love became fused in Wesley's mind with his own Anglican tradition of holiness as aspiring to love, and thereafter was developed his own most distinctive doctrinal mark. Or as Wesley himself put it, Perfect love is the conscious certainty in the present moment of the fullness of one's love of God and neighbor, as this love has been initiated and fulfilled by God's gifts of faith and love. Now, if all of that is packed into this little term, Christian perfection, remember that's where I started a few minutes ago, all that I've been going through in terms of the different types of faith, it's all packed into this notion of perfection because perfection is just loving God and loving one's neighbor. But in order to love God, one must have a perception of spiritual things and also realize that God loves oneself and loves one's neighbor. If that's what he means by perfection, then what does Wesley not mean by perfection? This is rather important. He does not mean that one will be free from ignorance or mistaken judgments, or bodily infirmments, or the threats of temptation. He thinks that's going to be just a feature of our lives as human beings. We're all going to suffer, we're all going to die, we're all going to have doubts, we're all going to be tempted. That's not what it means by Christian perfection is overcoming all of those things. He's talking about this temper of mind and heart discerning God and the love of one's neighbor. Right? And he thinks that that will free one to live in the world in a way that is not shackled by uh, the problems of sin and social aggression. As I said, this ignited in the Wesleyan movement a desire to transform the society, forming schools, meeting like this in class meetings, uh, and really helped revolutionize um, the English scene. 
That being the case, he was still a loyal Tory, a conservative. He was against the American Revolution. Nonetheless, he fought slavery and started a process that worked itself out into the transformation of our nation. So what I've done in the history part now is, is, is raise our initial examination about happiness and holiness to show that it takes us back into history at a very crucial point where Wesley is arguing with another representative of the Anglican Church and how he comes out on this. <coughs> and that lets me conclude in just a minute with uh, reason and the moral life. So that's where we're going to end. We live in a society where many Christians decry science and in fact most forms of knowledge. We regularly see the bumper sticker I mentioned before, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. All of that is very non-Western. So the title of this course was picked to attention. Thinking like a Methodist, because Methodist is deeply committed to the place of thinking about our faith in the midst of the life of faith. In fact, Wesley once wrote a famous two-part treatise addressed to, quote, men of reason and religion. And he thought those should be the same people. His problem was not science. He actually wrote a book called Primitive Physics, which was on medicine to help the poor. He did experiments with shock treatment for people with psychiatric problems. His problem was not science. His problem was the halfway Christian. His problem was with people spouting doctrines but not living what they claim to believe. His problem was how to ignite the heart of Christians to actually believe in the love of God and the love of neighbor, live their lives accordingly. We're going to see how this question of thinking like a Methodist, and therefore the place of reason and thinking within the life of faith, plays itself out in each of the next five sessions. So we'll also be getting a much more nuanced view of this as we proceed. And we're going to be also addressing the various sources of Methodist theology as we proceed through the next sessions. Okay? Throughout all of this, we are also practicing a kind of middle way in the media, but in a distinctively Wesleyan way to do this. And next time, we're going to turn and spend more time on those two different levels of faith that I talked about earlier. Okay. Now that's what I wanted to say today. It went a little longer than perhaps you prepare up under. Um, <clears throat> but I wanted to give you an overview of sort of what we're doing in the whole course. Things may have gone too fast. We will be hitting all of these topics again uh, because that's important in the process of learning. But let's see who has questions or comments or criticisms or and we can get a conversation going. Anyone have an immediate? Yes, sir. One of the things that I'm hoping you'll cover in this course is when you sign up to be a Methodist, there's a double evil. I call it the double evil pledge. Resist the evil forces of wickedness. And then there's another one that's very related, but I've never really clearly understood the difference. And I think it's related to what you're talking about more evil recognition in Methodism versus Anglicanism. Uh, but anyway, whenever that... Yeah, I, I think you, if I remember, we maybe need to get the text itself, but it's something like, do you denounce the spiritual forces of evil? Yeah. And then there's a second phrase that you're trying to get. Yeah, which is related, so it's a different, it's kind of like personal evil, but worldly right. evil, and that kind of thing. That, that's exactly right. Wesley wants to make sure um, that we understand that evil operates in systems, yeah, and social yeah. systems. I mean, let's get brass tacks, okay? Um, Wesley, Wesleyans are often known as teetotalers. Didn't drink. Does anyone know where that term comes from? Wesley introduced the drinking of tea to England in the East End because he'd set up his church in the poorest area of London along City Road, which was filled with gin factories, where the workers were being paid in alcohol. 
<clears throat> so they were then becoming trapped in a system. Not unlike the poor people around the world that have to make Nike shoes for us, or iPads and stuff like that. Wesley went into this, and as he converted some of those workers, he insisted that A, they start drinking tea, and B, they demand a wage. Okay. So it's not that he's against alcohol. When I was at Wesley's Chapel, we would regularly have a wonderful court <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the man. So the, that's not the issue. The issue is there are spiritual forces of wickedness that work in social systems to ground human beings down. Right? But if we already know that our problem is how we're going to relate happiness and holiness, then such a society, such a world is a real problem. Right? And one must work against that. But then he's also aware of the ways in which, if we're all honest, those forces are also creeping in our own lives. But the, the important thing to realize here is that Wesley, while well, he can be extremely uh, forceful, and his diagnosis of human wrongdoing and sin, the underlying message is about happiness. It's about living a full human life. That's the underlying message of this tradition and how it's to be found in living in faith to Christ and God. Was that help? Was that getting answered? Yeah. yeah. We'll come up to those. I've, what I've done, and the way the course is structured in the second half, is I've tried to break up the 13 sermons of the Sermon on the Mount that he gave into larger blocks of similar themes. So we'll be hitting some of those as we proceed. Any, any other questions or conversation? Yeah. You had mentioned early in the examination a uh, huh. question that said, "Are you holy? Do you think you're holy enough to be happy?" Is that, was that the yeah. exact words you used? Yeah. And I'm just curious as to how many of us actually do feel that way. Because uh, I think there's a tendency, I believe, in good old churchgoers to get a good warm feeling about ourselves, right. right? And think that we, that's why we're happy or that we deserve to be happy. Mm -hmm. And then he went on to talk about... Now notice, but notice, when yeah. we do that, we tend to take as the evidence that we're happy, um, a good job, Love the family, I'm successful, therefore I must be good. It's all based on the evidence of things seen. But what about the unseen things? The real thoughts of one's own heart. The real effects you're having on other human beings. You see, I, I agree with you. I think most of us imagine that we are righteous enough that obviously we're going to end up in heaven. Right? Well, our hearts are warm in church. One hopes. Our hearts are warm in our family that loves us. So that kind of feeds the concept mm -hmm. that we're holy enough to be happy. If what you're getting at is that religion can be its own most dangerous element, you're right. Yeah. You're right. That's why we do theology and ethics. Because religion left to itself can be very dangerous and self-deceptive. The moral beliefs, I mean, and I'm not sure you all got the full force of what I was saying about the notion of morals. Nazi Germany had a morality. It had a belief system about what was good, what was just, what was right, who mattered, who was to be given respect, but it was a completely unethical and evil morality. The same thing, I think we've got to be able to say that when Christians bomb clinics or Muslims get on planes and destroy people, something deeply has gone wrong in that religion. Theology is trying to think about religion because of its dangers. Ethics is trying to think about morality because of its dangers. That's why we do the second stepping back and ask and think about these things. Am I understanding what you're getting at here, or Greg? I think you're, you are, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The other comment you made is about the, uh, the aristocracy saying we're not sinners like the commoners are. 
of her, her rejection. I'm the curious Duchess of Buckingham. How much of that DNA is transferred to the U.S.? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I seriously mean that. I think there's a sense that uh, I had an old belief around what the Holy Spirit was, the things that are carried through our generations to us. And I think that aristocracy piece is carried through generations to us. So there, there's a sense that uh, I, I believe that we do believe we're better than the commoners. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. And we, we, may not, we may not enjoy that belief, but I think it's there. And I think it came down through the generations to us. That's another reason to do ethical thinking to call into question the ways we've been formed, the beliefs we had. What you enunciate, I think, is one of the most profound ethical principles of the scriptures. The sins of the fathers are visited on their children to the seventh generation. This is another way of talking about systemic sin, the way it just tumbles down through the generations. So, yeah. Yes, please. Are we going to get into um, more of an explanation of how, how Wesley looks at that love of self. You said the highest um, uh, love is the love of God and the neighbor as, as your truest self, but in there is loving your neighbor as yourself. Right. So how does, how does he address that? Right. Are we going to talk about yes, that? and this may be, it's very important, and he has a lot to say about this. Um, and this may some, say something about him and old butler. That, 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 right? Um, both Wesley and um, Butler agreed with Hobbes that human beings are unrelentingly egoistic. It's just that Butler and Wesley thought we're not only that. Wesley and Butler, in fact, much of the Christian tradition didn't think he had to teach people to love themselves. They're really good at this. And they can be really good at it in incredibly deceptive ways. So the person who is always serving others, but intending immense pride in serving others. Uh, the person who thinks, I'm the meekest person in the world, I would never harm anyone, is also elevating themselves in an odd way. Right? So the strategies of self-deception around self-love is something that these guys are very, very aware of. Now, in our situation, Wesley and Butler lived before Freud. It's very important to remember. They don't know anything about modern psychology. Right? We know that there can be psychologically cultural systems that are destructive of the capacity of self-love. That's just before their world. So when I said before, we have to engage this thought to ask what we can learn and what we must change. One of the things that's going to have to be changed is the picture of the psychology behind this. As brilliant, for instance, as Butler's account of the structure of the cell as having these three different levels, compared to what we would think nowadays about the psychological constitution of human beings, is naive. Um, so what I'm trying to do is to, to get at the ethical and the theological issues and then ask what, how would we want to update them correctly and so on and so forth. Uh, but it's very important to realize that most, mod, most Christian thinkers before the 20th century assumed that human beings had no trouble loving themselves. And they would find the most incredible ways to say to themselves they're really not. That's just a feature of much of the history of Christian Anything else? We have another seven hours. <laughs> so, so, so the main thing that deflation of self ego is that ego is happiness and that our faith system is a thing that can be played. Wesley's the, the Wesley's not but many people in the history of God have. There was a very famous 
British philosopher novelist named Iris Murdoch, who was a British person. Um, she once wrote that the central problem in human existence is the fat and relentless ego. And she thought that the whole point of moral life was to deflate. That's not what Wesley said. He really wants to see a love of oneself and a love of one's neighbor through love in a way that leads to human happiness. Holiness, right? He's really concerned with the flourishing of life. So the ego based on that is good, ego self-centeredness. Right. Self-centeredness would be another term for self-love or the traditional term is pride. Making oneself, and you'll see this in the Ruben Job text, making oneself the center of everything. So can I clarify this, like, Hobbes, where he said, um, human beings should be egoistic, is this more constructive or destructive? Who, you're talking about Hobbes? Yeah. Hobbes just took it as a psychological fact that we all are driven by self-interest. That doesn't mean negative or positive, just neutral. Oh no, he thought that what we really, if you want to get down to the brass tacks, yeah. the position is not just that I want my self-interest. Hobbes thought what I really want is I want to be able to bully over you and destroy you and take whatever you have so I can have it. That's why it's the war of each against the uh, Some have said that what Thomas Hobbes did was take the Protestant conception of the sinner and make it the natural human being. <laughs> Which is very important. You've got to remember, Christianity believes that human beings were not created sinners. And we'll see as we go on, Wesley, and it's in a lot of the hymns. I mean, I hope one of the things also that this course does is you'll start singing the Wesley hymns in a very different way because you're going to find all of this theology in the verses of the hymns, right? Um, and he constantly talks about a new creation, restoring what we were when we were created by God. That's not Hobbes. Hobbes' argument is that we all are at war against each other. What I really want at the, bottom, at the end of the day is to be able to dominate everyone in this world. You're probably thinking, that's what you've been doing all evening. <laughs> <laughs> Does that help? Yeah, it helps. Anything else? Any comments from each other? We're near our time here. I, I, thought yes. that, I thought the total deflation of our ego was the reason why the game of golf was created. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all very much. I hope this gave you a sense of what we're going to be doing. I hope it's, I'll be here even if it's just me and Phil next time. <laughs> but I hope you all come back and you pick up the Ruby Joe book and take a look through it. You'll see how I'm interfacing at various points with it. Um, and uh, we're just going to have this kind of conversation uh, each time. I'll talk for a while and then we're going to get into the text. Okay? So remember, if you can think about picking a passage out of the books to be read through the next time. After I get done with my lecture, we can start going on those texts, okay? Um, I oftentimes say one of the most difficult human enterprises is reading. And we're trying to learn how to read in a different way. Okay, yeah, Bill's point about the hymnal. When the sermon hits that trough and you go and look in the hymnal and see the theology that's in the table of contents. Much of what you will discover in the next five sessions is portrayed in there is how those hymns are laid out, what those stories are, and how. Um, so the anthropology of faith is in there. Right. Charles Wesley. Um, David, thank you so much for being here and recording this, and thank you for the commercial over here, Stephanie, whatever else <laughs> we ended up with in town with the photographs. Uh, the, the books are now out there. Today we can pick one up. If you have any. Uh, uh, settling to do with uh, Johnny and registration, you can do that. You can certainly stay and talk with each other, but uh, let people know it's open. Come on in, and Bill, thanks so much. Thank you. And I can hang around the folks on the talk.